Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm a postdoc. I work with Bob Cook. And on his behalf, and on behalf of Bruce Potter, I'll give you a quick update on two ongoing projects. First one is about soybean aphid remote sensing, more specifically about the effects of defoliation on the spectral refinement of soybean. And the second, about soybean damage. So I'll be talking about distribution, seasonal dynamics, alternative crop and non-crop host. So starting with the soybean remote sensing. As you know, soy soybean aphid is an invasive species feeding in and soybean and it remains a significant pest in the upper Midwest. And as you know, treatment decisions are based on field scouting and comparing those those populations to an economic threshold, so populations can be treated before they reach an economic injury level. But this can be time consuming and that can increase the overall cost. So remote sensing is coming up as, a, as an alternative because it's, it can be faster and it allows for early detection of plant stresses. And how that works, basically we use sensors they are able to detect changes in the electromagnetic spectrum. So from the incoming sunlight, the, the, the light reflecting, especially in the visible spectrum, but also, for example, here in the infrared, those, those sensors are able to detect those changes. Not going into all the details in here, but using this idea, previous, previous studies in the lab, done by Taz and Zach, they were students of Bob, and they found out that ground sensors can be used to, to detect aphids as well as ground-based sensors. So we know that stressors in the field, they can happen at the same time. So we have, for example, soybean aphid, but it can have, let's say, foliation. And kind of as a follow-up question, we asked ourselves, are we still able to detect aphids under the presence of other stressors. So to answer that question, we selected Japanese beetle as an example of an insect defoliation. So we use these insects to simulate, not to simulate, but actual, to have an actual insect feeding. But we included artificial defoliation as an extra treatment to simulate higher levels of defoliation. And the reason for that is because actual insect feeding, when you look at the, for in this case here for Japanese beetles, when we look at the plants, they might look really bad, but the foliation when we estimate, yeah, it's actually not that bad, as I'll show you in a moment. Okay, so to do that, we have trials <coughs> over four, four, in four side years, in 2019, 2020, and 2021 in St. Paul, Rochester, and Rosemont, Minnesota. And to do that, we use cages like this to manipulate the insects and the artificial foliation. This was done in St. Paul and Rosemont. And in Rochester, we have open field trials using insecticides to manipulate the pests. But for the sake of time, I'll show you what happened this year in St. Paul and Rosa. So we counted aphids weekly. We collected spectral measures with a handheld machine and uh, the foliation was estimated by collecting leaves out in the field, bringing them back to the lab and using a software to calculate the actual defoliation. So this is what we see out there, especially on the upper canopy. But going into the results, this is for St. Paul. The treatments are here. No death means no defoliation, so the control plants. RTF is artificial defoliation. So this graph shows the plant reflectance, the 780 nanometers. This is actually uh, a wide band selected previously as an optimal band to detect aphids done by those students. And different liners indicate significant differences between the treatments. So that means that artificial defoliation reduced the overall plant reflectance. 
here we have the U, same, same treatments, and as expected, artificial defoliation reduced the overall yield. This is for Rosemont. So we included the Japanese middle defoliation here. So this graph is showing the defoliation for the control plants, close to zero. For the Japanese beetle defoliation, we had on average 5%. So when we look, as, a, as I said, when we look at the plants and on the upper canopy, we can have defoliations as high as 15% sometimes, or 20. But on average, when we consider the whole plant, we get something around 5%. And this was by throwing uh, thousands of Japanese beetles in there. So this again is for the plant reflectance, and with the three, three treatments: here. control Japanese beetles and artificial foliated plants. There was a numerical reduction in plant reflectance, but stati statistically speaking, just artificial foliation was significantly different from the control. Japanese beetle was not statistically significant. For the yield, same thing. Japanese beetle defoliated plants had a yield similar to the control plants, and artificial defoliation again reduced the plant yield. So what all that means is that typical levels of Japanese beetle defoliation close to 5%, it's, it's unlikely to affect the remote sensing for aphids. However, if we get more defoliation, in this case we, we use higher than 30% defoliation with the artificial foliation, then we can have an effect on remote sensing. Kind of next steps, we are planning to analyze ground-based data, we also collect imagery from those fields. So we're planning to analyze that map. And we also started working with satellite, satellite imagery. So that's the next step. Um, okay, so now going to the soybean garbage information. This is actually a pretty new insect uh, described in 2019. This is the adult, this is a fly. You can see the picture. But the maggots cause the actual damage. So they feed at the base of the plant. And if you if you peel off the, the skin, you, you can see the them in here. Uh, there are coloration cha uh, changes between white and orange. And feeding can cause coloration at the base of the plant, as you can see here in the this picture in the middle. And continuous feeding, uh, feeding can lead to plant wilting and death, especially at the field borders where the infestations are higher. <laughs> so, first detection occurred in 2018. This picture here shows the uh, known range. Uh, and it's uh, expanding, but we don't know if that's because the insect is actually spreading <laughs> or if we're just getting better at detecting it. Okay, so this graph shows the community of emergence of adults in, in, a, in a farm in Rock County, Minnesota in 2021. Uh, this, is, this was done in four fields in the, in, the, in the farm. And what this messy information here means is basically that we have at least three generations out, of, out there throughout the season. So we have an overwintering generation coming out in mid-June to late June. So these adults migrate to the soybean fields. They reproduce and come out in mid-July to late August. And we have a second summer generation in mid-August to late August. So this is a trial done by Bruce 
using 15 soybean and driving cold cars. These, these are greenhouse grown plants, as you can see in the picture here. So what he did was he, he placed the, those plants at the border of a field, as a soybean field with history of soybean gum infestations. He left them there for one week and then brought, he brought back to, to the lab so he could dissect them. But soybean gobbit was found only within soybean stem. So they did not, were, they were not found on the other plants. But we know that they can feed in alfalfa and sweet over too. But that was found when those fields were closed to infested soybeans. Okay, I want to thank the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council and the Minnesota Invasive Thresher Plant and Best Center for their funding during this research. research. But as a bonus, during the co collection of the data for, for the remote sensing this year, we just found a new soybean leaf miner. So that's actually a new pest. The soybean leaf miners, are, they're, they're usually small beetles. But this one is actually a tiny mouth. The adult is here. It's orange, white, and black, so it's quite different. And the larva caused the damage. So you can see the mines here. So this picture was taken in Canada, but we found this in late August this year in St. Paul and in Rosemont. And this is pretty new, so we don't know the actual damage to, to soybean eggs yet. So if you if you think you saw something like that this year, or if you see that next year, please please let us know. This is actually an, uh, uh, a native species known to feed in American hog peanut and sickle soybean, sickle seed cousin. That they are from in the same family as soybean, so it's probably expanding the the, the its whole uh, range and included soybean. So if you see something like that, or if you think you saw it, these are our contact information. Please let us know. If you have any other questions or if something comes up, feel free to contact us. Do you have any questions? Thank you. 